But there are certain factions within Congress on both the Democrat and Republican side that is enough to say, I don't like the way that the SEC is going right now. And the more fights Gary Gensler picks, and especially the more ones he loses, that's really going to send a message to uh, Joe Biden that's saying, look, is he the man you want to have at running the SEC when you're on the top of the ticket in 2024? This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto exchange that I've been using for years. In fact, I've been using them since 2018. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. You can also trade precious metals and 37 fiat currencies on this platform, and you can instantly swap between crypto and precious metals in these fiat currencies. So Uphold is a unique platform. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Ron Hammond, who's Director of Government Relations at the Blockchain Association. Ron, it's great to have you on, on this Monday morning. Great being here again. Good to see you as always, Tony. Well, Ron, uh, I had to have you on because there's so much going on in D.C. around crypto. Let's start with two new hearings that popped up on the calendar last week, and that's happening this week, tomorrow and Wednesday, one with the SEC and one about digital assets uh, in general. Yeah, definitely. So um, we're starting to see, you know, Congress kind of coming back from their uh, August recess here. Now, mind you, again, usually uh, in August, they're back in their districts. They're talking to voters and constituents. September is when they come back and they get back to legislating here, especially with the shutdown that was uh, almost averted, thank God. Um, but at the same time, all the speaker drama has really slowed down a lot of the, the progress here in Congress, especially with Patrick McHenry as the lead of Financial Services Committee. Uh, he's been now the temporary speaker as the House Republicans try to get their act in order. So we're finally kind of started seeing the hearings coming back again in financial services. And that's what we're seeing uh, the main talking points and the main issues for Patrick McHenry and other Republicans largely is just the SEC's posture, not only for crypto, but for private equity. Recently, they put out some new rules that are very concerning for that industry. AI is now getting caught up as well in the SEC's uh, sting. So when we talk about, you know, the digital asset subcommittee, largely has been more crypto, but we're starting to see them kind of pivot away to a little more larger fintech issues, AI issues, because uh, that's also uh, on the target list for uh, Chair Gensler. So uh, we'll be seeing a little bit more of that. Um, the other hearing to look forward to is uh, more on the national security uh, subcommittee hearing. Uh, again, this is going to be largely focusing around Hamas uh, and the funding mechanisms that they have for uh, carrying out their activities uh, on the terrorism side. Uh, this has been a long concern for a lot of policymakers on both sides of the aisle. National security is a very big policy issue uh, and very big concern. And the kind of the question is, where's the money coming from? Was it crypto? Was it not crypto? Was it coming from the United States uh, and other charities potentially tied to Hamas? Um, are there other nation states involved? And so I think it's a lot of fact finding right now. We've seen a lot of noise in the media recently. Um, from a variety of views, including Elizabeth Warren saying crypto is actually the, the culprit here. Uh, but we have the facts to back that up. But I think at the same time, it's important just to have all the facts out there. So members of Congress uh, can have a bipartisan idea of like, you know, look, what needs to be done or should something be done um, on the situation? Because it's very horrifying what's happening uh, in the Middle East. Yeah, for sure. And it seems like Elizabeth Warren is trying to take advantage of what's happening in the Middle East to try to paint crypto with a broad brush, because she referenced a Wall Street Journal article which had a lot of factual errors. Um, and it seems like uh, I, well, I've been seeing a lot of tweets, a lot of people calling out and fact checking that article. Um, and I saw that uh, Blockchain Association, Kristen, uh, head of Blockchain Association, invited uh Senator Elizabeth Warren to come meet at a uh, an event. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, actually, we have our large policy summit here in D.C. at the end of November. Uh, this will be our second one. We're really looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to have folks from Treasury and FinCEN. Uh, we're going to have folks from Congress as well. Um, but Elizabeth Warren is uh, you know, someone who's been critical of uh, the industry as a whole. And in our opinions, look, we want to uh, you know, come, have you come by and meet the actual innovators themselves. Talk about your positions. Where did you come to the uh, rationale? It's solely crypto to blame here. Um, but also, why don't you meet the folks in the national security realm on crypto who do the more analytics stuff, who can tell you exactly what they're seeing and what law enforcement is seeing. Talk to the innovators who are building a really amazing things that can help with a lot of the uh, concerns you may have on compliance, AML, KYC, and what have you. Um, and then finally, 
Also, it's important just to meet the constituents who may live in her district or her state, uh, but all across the world, what they're building. Uh, you know, again, she likes to really focus on the negatives here. Uh, but you also want to show her the positive. There's a lot of people who have invested uh, their livelihood into this industry. They believe in this industry. Um, and I think it's important to say, look, why do these people come over here? What was so appealing? Um, you should come here and meet them. Um, and Elizabeth Warren has been a little difficult to meet with candidly, uh, at least from a lobbying perspective. Uh, we've been in contact with her staff. Her staff has been uh, you know, largely responsive to us. But, you know, of course, we want to talk to the member herself. And I think it's really important to have her, um, you know, meet other folks in the industry um, and have those uh, holistic opinions. So uh, we'll see if she uh, takes up the offer. Um, you know, she is uh, someone that doesn't step away from a fight. So th it is potentially likely she does uh, accept the offer. But regardless of the situation, we want to make sure we just have a full set of facts outside for members of Congress to, you know, take, uh, look at and have an informed opinion. And that comes from both the industry as well as the government and law enforcement. Mm. Now, Ron, there's been quite a few things around the uh, SEC and a Bitcoin spot ETF happening. Uh, for example, the SEC lost the grayscale with the uh, judges just calling the SEC arbitrary and capricious for not approving the Bitcoin spot ETF or Grayscale's Bitcoin spot ETF. Uh, in addition, you have Larry Fink making the media rounds, talking about crypto and Bitcoin spot ETFs, uh, multiple applicants updating their filings and so forth. Um, is that playing any level or role in policymaking or is it just like, you know, more on the outside and, you know, or, or is Larry Fink you know, being he's the CEO of BlackRock, uh, you know, having some influence. I mean, BlackRock definitely does have some influence here in D.C. I think there's a lot of folks who do look to them more on the institutional side um, as more of a stamp of approval of sorts. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's kind of like the SBF trial happening right now. It has largely kind of gone back to the, the sidelines here in terms of the tension. Uh, whenever a major crisis, especially of national security or especially involving an ally, we had the same issue with Ukraine uh, back in February of last year where all the attention of everything else going on uh, goes to the side and goes laser focused to the issue at hand. Um, and that's on top of having a speaker race, too. So, um, you know, the, the coin telegraph uh, hiccup that happened last week that, you know, came up a couple of times in my meetings last week. Uh, Larry Fink has come up here and there. But for the most part, it's largely out of Congress's hand. I mean, they put a lot of political pressure on the SEC for months now saying you guys need to approve this. Um, but we've seen that the courts were really the, the, the kicker here where they say, again, 3-0, arbitrary and capricious, two of those being Democrats uh, or Democrat appointed uh, judges here. So I think that's really important. I think the political pressure is really ramping up on uh, Chair Gensler. We see a lot of folks saying 75 percent chance that we're going to get a uh, Bitcoin spot ETF this year. Um, I'll leave that to the experts here. But I think here, in, uh, at least in D.C. and in Congress, a lot of the political pressure has been applied. The courts have reaffirmed that. Um, and the balls is a court. If he does object to the next uh, round spot ETFs, the question remains, uh, what's it going to be? Is it going to be custody or something else that he brings up as the, the main factor for denying these applications? But the pr uh, blowback will be pretty intense. So we'll see if he goes through with that. Um, it's honestly uh, uh, a black box at this point. Now, speaking of blowback, um, going back to the Speaker of the House uh, situation, and we could potentially see Tom Emmer become Speaker of the House. We know he's pro-crypto and he has been a big critic of Gary Genser and the SEC. You know, what do you, what do you think the chances are of Tom Emmer potentially getting that seat? I know that's a hard question. And are there other pro-crypto uh, candidates in, in runnings for this? Yeah, so we have nine candidates right now. Uh, and and to remind you again, the House has gone through several other leading candidates before, like Scalise and Jim Jordan, who are now off the, the table. So we're down, to, or so we went from down a couple to down to up to nine. So that field's really going to narrow. But right now, Tom Emmer is the lead candidate. It's largely because he's the number three ranking Republican in the House. He has a great uh, staff. He's got a great operation. Uh, and he has good name recognition. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing folks from the Trump camp and a lot more of the you know, conservative side of the party really attacking Tom Emmer and saying he's not conservative enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem. When you have margins so slim uh, here in the House Republicans, they can only afford a few to, uh factions to uh to leave uh not vote for tom emmer and so the question is does he have enough to get 217 and it hasn't worked that for uh the other candidates beforehand and so i think what we're going to see is a narrowing of the field and it really will come down to does he have the votes and it, it's tough to map it up at the current moment i will say there's three scenarios here tom emmer wins this week for the republican conference and the general house floor vote that's one situation Situation number two is that we see the field kind of narrow. 
You mentioned other candidates. Uh, Byron Donalds, he's been very pro crypto. He um, is from Florida. He is uh, one folks to uh, consider. We also have Pete Sessions from Texas. He's very pro uh, Bitcoin, more Bitcoin mining issues. Uh, he's also in the race, very senior as well. Um, but I think right now Emmer is still the lead candidate. I think we'll probably have either then a split in the second scenario where we have maybe two or three candidates. And next week they try to figure out who the lead candidate is. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the last scenario, which I'm still putting more of my, um, uh, you know, if I had to be a betting man here, I'd probably be more, more bets in this camp, is that they just don't get to 217 for any of the candidates. And so they decide, you know what, kick the can down the road. Let's deal with this in January. Let's have McHenry be temporary speaker, give him some more additional powers so we can just get move forward with legislating on Ukraine funding, Israel funding, uh, humanitarian relief. And of course, we have a shutdown coming down November 17th. Like that's also a major, major issue. And so uh, the House is pretty paralyzed. They just need to figure this out. So um, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll at least have either a new speaker or we'll just have McHenry uh, keep on trucking until uh, January. Yeah, I... <laughs> I obviously Patrick McHenry is a great candidate as well. Uh, hopefully they can get, you know, that sorted out and with all the other things that are coming down the, the pipeline. Um, now there was some rules um, by the IRS about crypto and taxing and reporting and so forth. That seems to be rearing its head again. I saw some folks in Coinbase push back on that. I think it's the origins of it go back to the infrastructure bill, right? Um, anything you can share there, anything new there? Definitely. So the um, so we were saying that the fall of this year was going to probably be the AML fight. We didn't obviously expect the Hamas situation. We had a feeling that it was percolating to the surface where enough members, more of the Democrat side, were concerned about money laundering issues and crypto. And again, as we know in the industry, that's more of the foreign folks. And again, that's more your Tether and Binance situation. That's less of your Coinbase USDC situation. Right. Um, and so that's kind of you know percolating in the background, but now it's risen to the top issue. But taxes is the next one, I think. Uh, taxes is kind of that issue that's been burning for a little bit uh, on issues like staking, for example. And to your point, the broker definition. Major fight that happened uh, back in 2021 with the infrastructure bill. But we had a bipartisan set of members of Congress to push back on the IRS saying, we don't think Bitcoin miners, DeFi protocols um, should really be sending 1099s to the IRS. That's a, a Coinbase, a Robinhood situation. And those folks do agree that they're the ones who should be sending 1099s. Um, and so... The Treasury uh, put out their, their proposal, and while miners seem to be safe, the DeFi side of its things, as well as self custody, seem to be captured still in the broker definition. Which again, that does not—they can't comply. They, they're literally they don't have the, uh, right. the information to report to the IRS. And so now the question is: Will the Treasury take the comments from industry and other experts and Congress um, to come up with a more revised definition, or are they going to stand their ground on what the current definition is uh, in the broker provision? And so on that front, I think if the Treasury Department does not take those comments fully, it's going to be another fight. It's going to probably be in a couple months from now if that does happen. But to watch tax issues. Tax issues are going to be uh, probably the next major uh, uh, talking point here in Congress as a lot of folks, uh, you know, eventually as time goes on with this conflict, hopefully it kind of does more fade away um, and they're able to be a resolution peacefully. But um, in the meantime, uh, a lot of the focus is still on money laundering issues as well as Moss and others. Hmm. Man, uh, there's a lot <laughs> to figure out and no shortage. Yeah. Um, is there anything else uh, around the corner, maybe upcoming hearings or, um, you know, any type of uh, event or whatever it may be that we should know about? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we just need to just take it into context here where we're at, at least for the election cycle. You know, we're almost a, a year away from the election and uh, a lot of folks um, more on the Republican side, because obviously they're trying to find who, who is going to be the presidential candidate to go against Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. um, but we're getting to the point really soon. And I think actually this got escalated with the recent Hamas-Israel uh, conflict, is that we're now seeing a lot more about my team versus your team, Republicans versus Democrats. And the bipartisan issues really go away. Now, sometimes national security can really you know, bring forces together, but it can also split them apart very easily. And so I think... Um, for us and the crypto side of things, we want to get these good bipartisan bills done. We want to get them to the president's desk on stable coins, market structure, and a whole host of other issues, including money laundering issues. You know, we want to put all the experts in the same room and to figure out how do we, you know, solve this, especially when it comes to foreign exchanges like Binance who are not complying with the rules. And so I think that's uh, you know going to be kind of the main issue. But as long as this, you know, the longer this drags out in Congress, the less attention. Uh, very serious bipartisan issues, again, for crypto will be coming up 
and would be more focusing on things like the border, abortion, the economy, you know, more general topics that really don't move legislation. They just move into the headlines of the media, which some folks want for their campaign. So uh, let's hope, for, you know, for our sake, we want to be moving forward in a, in a bipartisan way. Um, and we hope to get those bills done sooner rather than later, because especially when it comes to summer 2024, it comes to a standstill here, even worse than it is right now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, final question here for you. Uh, you know, given and, and this is not to promote Democrats or Republican, but, you know, the Biden administration, I think it's factual that Joe Biden in the polls is not doing well. Uh, Gary Genser and the SC are taking a lot of losses and in the in both in the court of law as well as the court of public opinion. Do you see any type of weakening as a result of the overall Biden administration not doing well you know, in the public polls affecting the SEC? In addition to their losses, and it's kind of a complex questions. And but you know, what do you think? I think the SEC is picking a lot of fights, um, and they're picking a lot of fights. And as we've seen, crypto has been taking the brunt of those fights. Um, I mentioned private equity and AI recently have gotten more into the uh, target hairs of the SEC. Um, but the thing that those industries have learned from the crypto industry is that you can beat the SEC in court, and not mm-hmm. once but twice. And that's been really uh, more of a bull weather sign for the other folks. In other industries who say, you know, the SEC is really tough to go against. They have a really good track record of winning these court cases. But now a lot more industries feel emboldened to go after um, uh, the SEC when they feel like they've overstepped on a lot of rulemakings recently. And so I think that also percolates, though, to other parts of the election, as well as other members of Congress who may not care about crypto, but they care about AI. And they're like, hey, why is the SEC really clamping down AI and data use case or data usage? Uh, at the same time, why are they going after private equity? Private equity has a lot of benefits. Some other members say they have a lot of downside as well. But there are f- certain factions within Congress on both the Democrat and Republican side that is enough to say, I don't like the way that the SEC is going right now. And the more fights Gary Gensler picks, and especially the more ones he loses, that's really going to send a message to uh, Joe Biden that's saying, look, is he the man you want to have at running the SEC when you're on the top of the ticket in 2024? Remains to be seen at this point, but I'll put it this way. He is losing a lot more friends, Chair Gensler, than gaining friends. Uh, there's been a lot more Democrats who have been a lot more critical openly, uh, whereas you know a couple months ago, just one or two or three Democrats, and now it's actually a pretty hefty amount. Again, not just for crypto, but for the other uh, industries affected by his rulemakings. Sure. And then I saw just this past week, Elon Musk and Mark Cuban decided to team up again uh, together to go against the SEC. I don't know if you got any caught up with that or you know read the details but anything you can share there i mean uh, especially for joe biden uh you know a lot of those uh donors probably more lean on the republican side i mean mark cuban i know he's a democrat uh but at the same time that's also a lot of money there and so you know when it comes to the election cycle there's still in the back of your mind will these big donors uh come out to support these super PACs or these other candidates um in these tough races again mind you the Republicans have a really tough time uh, in, come 2024 to defend the House. It's looking uh, a little slim right now for them. But on the Senate side, the Democrats are actually defending a lot of seats and they're looking to uh, potentially lose the Senate. So the, mm-hmm. the, there's fights in Congress and there's fights at the presidential level. Uh, and so I think it's really important for folks saying, look, money runs these campaigns. A lot of these billionaire donors are reaching out concerned about the SEC. Will these be the people supporting Joe Biden and others? Uh, uh, down the, the 2024 cycle, or are they going to pivot and switch parties or stay out of it completely? So I think that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions you raise, but um, that letter for sure, it raised a couple of eyebrows here in DC. Wow. Ron, uh, always great information, my friend. Thank you so much. Anytime. Thanks for having me again.